Ben ritrovati al Cicca Festa, oggi abbiamo un altro ospite speciale che eh, non è riuscito a essere con noi fisicamente ma che ha voluto essere presente e intervenire. Si tratta di Lee McIntyre, professor McIntyre, che è Research Fellow del Center for Philosophy and History of Science della Boston University, oltre che autore di numerosi saggi sulla scienza e in particolare su chi la scienza la rifiuta, come il suo ultimo libro How to talk to a science denier, come parlare con un negazionista scientifico. Welcome Lee to Chickapest. Thank you very much for having me, I appreciate it. It's a pleasure. Lee, tu sei un filosofo della scienza e la tua specialità è proprio eh, il negazionismo scientifico. Allora, che cosa ti ha portato a studiare e indagare in questo campo che oggi chiaramente è sulle prime pagine dei giornali in tantissimi ambiti? che ti lo vediamo davvero ogni giorno, ma forse quando hai iniziato a occupartene non era così diffuso. Yeah, boy, that's true. I mean, science denial has been around for a long time, but it's gotten worse, so everybody's talking about it now. Um, I'm a philosopher of science, and so I've been interested my entire career in the question that all philosophers of science want to know, what's special about science? How do you tell science from non-science or, or worse, from pseudoscience? And we really don't have very good theories of this. It's been a hundred years and we haven't solved the problem. And I started to notice that the science deniers were saying things that philosophers weren't helping to, to debunk and, you know, to get out of there. And so we needed a better theory of science. And so I worked on that for a long time and then thought, well, I'm just going to start working on the problem of science denial in general because it seems to me It's not just having a good theory, it's really analyzing what the science deniers are doing wrong and reflecting that back in language that everybody can understand. And it sure turned out to be the problem of our age. Come hai spiegato bene nel tuo libro, il negazionismo eh, scientifico non consiste tanto nel negare la realtà di alcuni specifici fatti scientifici quanto nel negare il processo scientifico, la mentalità, il ragionamento che sta dietro la scienza. That, that's right. I mean, they, they clearly do d- deny specific uh, things that they don't like, uh, evolution, particular vaccines, uh, uh, you know, the theory of evolution, whatever it is. But um, it, it really is uh, very much true that in general, what happens is that it's the process of reasoning that the science deniers use that's the flaw. Um, and the flaw, and the problem is that that same flawed reasoning is used by all science deniers for anything that they deny. Nel libro racconti eh, un'esperienza che hai avuto partecipando a una convention di terrapiattisti. Ci vuoi raccontare com'è andata? Yes. Um, in November 2018, I flew out to Denver, Colorado, and uh, I had the, the badge and, you know, the, the program, and I was ready to go at the Flat Earth International Conference, which was 650 flat earthers from all around the world, though they wouldn't put it that way, um, <laughs> who were convinced that they were right on scientific grounds. Now, that's the interesting part. That's really why I went. Because this was not something where they were claiming that their view was based on faith or, you know, some kind of revelation. They thought that, um, you know, as conspiracy theorists, that the scientists were lying to them and that they had scientific evidence to show that they were lying. And so I wanted to be there as a philosopher, not to talk to them about physics, but just to talk to them about how they were reasoning. And my approach was just to get them to listen. I mean, if I'd been able to convince somebody, that would have been great, very hard to do in a venue like that. But I just wanted to see if I could have a respectful conversation, if I could get them to listen to me. And the key I found was to listen to them. In particolare ricordo l'episodio che racconti nel tuo libro di uh, un incontro che hai avuto con un esponente a questa convention, un, un relatore, insomma una persona competente nel suo campo, diciamo pure così, eh, ed è stato anche quello un'esperienza molto singolare. The interesting part was I found one of the fellows who was giving a seminar on how to recruit people into Flat Earth. He was a smart guy, and he could talk. I mean, he was a persuasive uh, a fellow. Um, and I took him out to dinner. We had dinner for two hours. And he was uh, with it enough, he understood, that uh, I asked him the following question. 
what, so you believe what you believe based on evidence? And he said, yes. And I said, well, then tell me what evidence I could offer you if it were true to convince you that you were wrong. And he understood that he had to answer that challenge because otherwise his view was just based on faith. But he couldn't come up with anything that worked. We talked about air travel uh, or uh, uh, rocket travel, but then he said, no, maybe the windows would be curved. And we finally settled on flying over Antarctica, which flat earthers don't think is a continent. They think it's a mountain range spread out around the perimeter of the earth. And so if I'm right, Antarctica is only 1,500 miles across or so, and if he's right, it's 26,000 miles. And so I proposed, let's take this trip, and he agreed. But then he immediately took it back. And the reason was interesting because I had said, we really need a criteria to judge. You know, I don't want you to say the window was curved. And the criteria that we came up with was, did we have to stop to refuel for gas? Because no plane can go 26,000 miles on one tank of gas. And he, when he took it back, he said that maybe that was a hoax. That maybe planes could go 26,000 miles on one tank of gas. At which point I said, so you think the entire history of air travel has been a hoax since before we were born? And he said, yes. yes. <laughs> just to fool us. <laughs> so that, just to fool us that evening. So that's why it's almost impossible to convince them, because no matter where the goalposts are, they will move them. But I did make him uncomfortable. And the reason he was uncomfortable is, I think, because he realized he didn't have a criteria. He didn't have anything that he could tell me that if I could show it to him, he'd change his mind. And of course, every scientist can do that. E comunque diciamo che c'è una eh, grande differenza tra qualcuno che rifiuta dei fatti eh, assodati, come può essere la forma eh, della Terra, no? che non è piatta, e magari danneggia se stesso, forse anche qualcuno della sua famiglia, no? dei figli, se per esempio li cresce con questa mentalità, e altri che però rifiutano cose come il cambiamento climatico, il Covid, e finiscono per danneggiare, sì, loro stessi, ma molte altre persone. But the, the really fat, and so this is where my, my scholar uh, mode comes in, my, my uh, nerd interested in this topic, because they reason the same way. The flat earthers and the climate deniers and the vaccine deniers and the evolution deniers, they all use the same five steps in science to now reasoning. I didn't come up with this, some cognitive scientists uh, did, and they all cherry pick evidence and engage in conspiracy theories and they're illogical and they rely on fake experts and they think that science has to offer proof, which it does not. And so, yes, the people that we really need to worry about are the climate deniers and the vaccine deniers because they're the ones that are killing us But I started with the flat earthers because it was the same. And boy, do the, the uh, others hate to hear that, right? If you're in a conversation with a climate denier and you point out that their reasoning strategy is the same as a flat earther, they will get angry at you. But then as you go through the five steps, it's really quite interesting. Uh, you know, to, and, and I've had those conversations and they, they, get, they get angry. Hai citato per l'appunto le cinque caratteristiche che hanno i negazionisti scientifici, così come sono state formulate dai fratelli Hufnagel e da altri ricercatori. Ci puoi eh, indicare un po' su qualcuno di questi, ci puoi dire qualcosa di più preciso? Yeah, I, I think that the, the threshold is conspiracy theories. Mm. Every single science denier is a conspiracy theorist. They may not tell you that at the beginning, but if you just... One great strategy is to just listen. Just let them talk. Let them try to convince you. And eventually they'll say something like, well, of course, that, those data were suppressed by the Institute of Medicine who was lying, you know, paid the CDC to lie on their behalf. And you say, well, wait a minute. Is there evidence for that? You know, there, there are, you know, the people who think that all of the world's scientists are in, or climate scientists are in on the conspiracy. Um, Uh, about uh, climate change being a hoax. Now, can you really get all scientists to agree on anything? I mean, they're competitive as hell. They, they <laughs> want to refute one another's theories. It would be impossible to keep a secret like that. 
So, so my my threshold going in to to recognize a science denier is to figure out if they're a conspiracy theorist. And um, you know, I've had I've had deniers get angry at me because they'll say things like, you know, you're, you're just calling me a denier because I question the scientific consensus, but Galileo did that. Hmm. And I say no. Um, your question is scientific consensus, but Galileo had the evidence. But you're not presenting me with evidence to compel me, nor are you telling me what evidence could convince you that you were wrong. So that that's another good way to think of it. Um, I mean, my, my favorite of the five steps is the idea that science has to offer proof. The flat earthers were all saying, you know, one of them, two of them, when I said, uh, what could I say to convince you that you were wrong? They said, just give me proof. And I said, well, I thought you said you were a scientist. Scientists don't offer proof. Sci- what do you mean? Well, scientists offer warrant based on evidence, and there's overwhelming evidence. Um, what's your evidence? I mean, you know, we're, we're going to talk likelihood and probability, not proof. That's not how science works. That really upset them. <laughs> but... Of course, that's, see, and that's another tool in the toolkit for scientists to push back. Because whenever a scientist is tempted to say, well, look, this has been proven, be careful. Because then they'll never trust you again. Look what happened with the early message about masks and COVID, where they came down a little too hard on what the data showed and then had to take it back later, and everybody accused them of being liars. So, my my discovery uh, in talking to science deniers is that we go into those debates thinking it's about facts, but it's really about trust. If they don't trust you, they're not going to listen to your facts. And, you know, part of how they got to be science deniers is because they listened to falsehoods long enough that they began to distrust the people who were telling the truth. So it's not just about doubting some particular fact. It's about thinking that the people who are scientists are all liars. That's the danger. A un precedente Cita Fest abbiamo avuto il piacere di avere ospite Naomi Oreskes, autrice di Mercanti del Dubbio. Eh, ci ha parlato appunto della strategia del tabacco, una strategia per negare la scienza che ora sembra essere diventata proprio la formula utilizzata da tutti coloro che vogliono rifiutare eh, la scienza, ma non solo quella, anche i fatti in qualunque altro ambito. It's true. Uh, I mean, science denial, of course, has been around as long as science. I mean, think back to, you know, not long ago I was I was in Rome standing in the Campo di Fiori before the statue of Giordano Bruno, who was burned, You every Italian knows this, burned at the stake for believing that uh, the, the stars were uh, uh, the, the other suns. So, I mean, science denial and <laughs> has been around for a long time. Uh, I love Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway's work because what they did was show that modern science denial, you know, as of about the 1950s, is motivated not just from ignorance, but from ideology or even from identity, from selfish interests. Um, it can be motivated by money or by ideology or Uh, the desire for political power. But what she calls the tobacco strategy uh, has really been the model for science denial since the tobacco uh, companies used it, uh, most infamously for climate change. You know, look what they're, uh, how, you know, they're, you've got corporate interests, the same as with the tobacco strategy. But you see it now even for uh, anti-vax. You see it for, uh, for other things as well. And, of course, the Internet makes it much worse. Um, when you go back to the 1950s, the tobacco companies took out full-page ads in American newspapers that reached about a sixth of the American population. They don't need to do that anymore. You can get a lie around the world in a matter of minutes now. And, and the problem with that, too, is that they can all talk to one another and form little communities and then have conventions like the Flat Earth Convention that I went to. So the problem now is that science deniers are organized. They're not the guy standing out on the street corner with the tinfoil hat handing out a mimeograph sheet saying we never went to the moon. There are still people who believe we didn't go to the moon. It's just that they've got a YouTube channel 
and a thousand followers now. That's the trouble. Even more, maybe. <laughs> oh, oh yes. No, that's right. Flat Earth for people who don't know is um, it's in in every uh, uh, country. I, I was shocked to find out that seven percent of the population of Brazil believe oh, yeah. in flat Earth. I mean, it's it's really shocking. La motivazione dietro il negazionismo scientifico, come dicevi, può avere diverse origini politiche, religiose, ideologiche, economiche magari, ma tutte queste motivazioni sembrano avere in comune il fatto che queste credenze, vere o false appunto che siano, non si basano sulle prove, sulle evidenze, ma sull'identità, stabiliscono l'identità, ce ne vuoi parlare? Yeah, another really fascinating part of the debate, because... If it were just about facts, then you could convince them with facts. If they just were doubters, then you show them the evidence and they go, oh, I was wrong and change their mind. But when someone's identity is at stake, then when you challenge their beliefs, you're challenging who they are. So when you're trying to convince them that they're wrong, you have to handle it differently. You can't just show them the facts. You have to talk to them, and this is what my book is about, you have to talk to them in a calm, patient manner, respectful, almost as if you were trying to change somebody's political beliefs or religious mm-hmm. beliefs, because in a sense, that is what you're doing. And so the bad news is that's much harder than convincing somebody with facts. But I think it does go some way to explain this. And you asked, I mean, one other question that follows on of what you just raised is how did they get this way? I don't think it's just misinformation. I think it's disinformation. Hmm. I think that there are, you know, not just the people who believe the lies. They're the people who create the lies. Science denial is not a mistake. It's a lie. The tobacco companies lied. The fossil fuel companies lied. People have interests at stake. Sometimes they're identity interests, religious interests, political interests. Um, And they will lie. And their goal is to get the, you know, vast, as many people as they can to believe the lie, not just so they believe something false, but so that they distrust the people on the other side. Because then the person who's lying to you, it's genius, right? Then, then oh, well, I'm the only one who can give you the truth. So just follow me. And that's how you get things like QAnon. That's how you get things like Flat Earth. Um, it's uh, it's terrible. Now I have to say, flat Earth is a, is a bit of an anomaly. For all the time I spent it there, I could never figure out who was making a buck on it. Why, you know, it's not a political, political movement. movement. It doesn't. It does. see, although, although quite a number of them were evangelical Christians, Christians. most Christians are not flat Earthers. I couldn't <laughs> figure out what was behind it. Um, so, so that that one uh, sticks out a little bit. But the others, I think. You can just identify what the interests are. Who would be served by making up a lie about climate change or the 2020 election in the United Mm -hmm. States? Now, of course, that's not science denial, but it follows the same format, the same five steps that the Hoofnagel brothers came up with. That's what my next book's about. Very interesting. So, (laughs) on politics. It's it's taking the science denial model and applying it to politics. Tu citi anche Anna Arendt e eh, il suo libro Le origini del totalitarismo eh, in cui le bugie politiche eh, vengono usate e sono usate anche oggi per controllare la popolazione. Lei si riferiva in particolare alla Germania nazista, all'Unione Sovietica, spiegando che l'obiettivo delle bugie è quello di subordinare la realtà alla politica eh, in modo da rendere le persone più ciniche e far loro dubitare che possano mai sapere la verità, in questo modo si arrendono no? e questo diventa uno strumento potentissimo per controllare una popolazione. Allora la domanda, visto che stai appunto eh, preparando questo nuovo libro dedicato agli aspetti politici del negazionismo, eh, pensi che una figura come quella dell'ex presidente Donald Trump cercasse di fare proprio questo negli Stati Uniti? Assolutamente. Uh, the cigarette companies were selling cigarettes. The fossil fuel companies are selling gas and oil. Donald Trump was selling himself. Uh, his interest was for him to have political power. But he discovered 
this strategy. And I don't think he studied it any more than the science deniers, you know, say, oh, well, here's the five-step strategy. I've got to learn this. I mean, it's just, it's part of what happens. Trump, I think, learned it. Uh, look, it's disinformation 101. The, the, um, it came out of uh, um, the Russian Revolution in the 1920s. Uh, uh, Derzhensky was um, uh, V.I. Lenin's uh, information minister, the, you know, the, the, the minister of propaganda. Uh, the, you know, the, the first one, and invented all of these tricks of disinformation. And, they, you know, they used it effectively to fight the, the white Russians. And, you know, part of the way that they, the revolution was successful, and even in the aftermath, was through the state learning how to lie. I think that's what Trump learned from Putin. I mean, Putin is ex-KGB, as we all know. And he's, there are uh, techniques. I've written about this a, a little bit so far in the Washington Post and some other places with uh, uh, my friend Jonathan Rausch, and uh, who's written on, on this as well by himself. And it's really shocking the extent to which um, people don't realize that what Donald Trump did was run the first domestic disinformation campaign in the United States. I mean, other countries do this to their own citizens all the time, but it had never been an organized disinformation campaign in the United States, I think, for political interests, but Trump did it. So it's easy to dismiss him as a buffoon. He's a genius at propaganda. He, he really knows. To, and again, I think he's a very intelligent person, but he has a kind of a feral sense of how to lie and what will convince people. Noi non possiamo cercare di far cambiare idea a negazionisti, o meglio, a quelli che creano disinformazione in maniera deliberata, ma forse possiamo raggiungere il loro pubblico. Come possiamo farlo? Quali sono le strategie che ci suggerisci? It's, that's really where we need to focus our effort. Um, if you think of the denial problem as a disinformation problem, you've got the people who create the disinformation, the people who amplify the disinformation, like social media or partisan media like Fox News, and then you've got the people who believe the disinformation. And I think the, the latter two are where we have to focus our efforts. Uh, my book is about the, you know, the last one, about the, the people who believe it. And, and I have to say, and I shouldn't say this, uh, maybe if I've tried to, you know, to, to sell my, my methodology here, because I, I do think it, it can work if anything can work. But I don't think it's the solution to the problem all by itself, because if you've ever spoken to a science denier and tried to be patient and respectful and calm, even if you do it right, you probably are not going to succeed. It's just it's so difficult to get through to them. So I think that there are other things that we need to do as well, which is um, try to prevent a disinformation from being amplified as much as it is. Um, the internet companies are hugely responsible for what's been happening and, you know, are not uh, policing disinformation in the way that they could because it's in, their, it's in their financial interest not to. They're making money on it. So, you know, in a way, I think of it that if we're talking to the people who believe the disinformation, it's like trying to heal somebody after they're already sick. You have to do it. You know, you can't forget about them, and it's, you know, they can transmit it to other people. But let's figure out what's causing the disease. You know, like in the cholera epidemic a uh, hundred years ago, let's get that pump handle, you know, that's infecting everybody, and that's coming through social media. The, the Center for Countering Digital Hate uh, did a uh, study last year, or maybe it was a year before now, which found that 65% of the anti-vax propaganda on Twitter was due to 12 people. Hmm. Let's find those 12 people and deplatform them on Twitter. You know, hmm. I mean, we know who they are. Why aren't they doing more? That's where I think we're really going to uh, make a difference for this. Um, now, we do need to talk to science how to convince the science tonight, how to talk okay. to them. We do need to have these conversations because my worry is that This problem is getting worse and has actually jumped now from science denial to reality denial. To the point where, to the point where you've got things like um, January 6th January insurrection. I think that's a base on a denialist campaign. And, you know, so just in the same.
dangerous. I think reality denial is dangerous, and it's the same problem. So do we need to talk to people across the political aisle? I think we do. But again, I think it's not the whole answer. I think we've got to have these conversations to try to heal ourselves, not just the, in the USA, but around the world. But we we really need to, to uh, worry about the amplification, too. Um, you know, in the because this is uh, uh, going to be broadcast in Italy, people will know that until recently, the uh, the government in Italy uh, was uh, had some anti-vax policies. I mean, look at uh, Five Star. Um, that was a dangerous moment when a false message was being amplified, not just through you know individual people who believed it, but through the government that people had elected. And so, you know, the problem is getting worse over time, and we do need to push back in every way that we possibly can. Talking to deniers, trying to get our elected representatives and others to crack down on the Internet companies and the partisan media, and where we can, you know, expose the plot of the uh, disinformers. Um, that that works in information warfare between states. states. Uh, I, think I think it's also it's important, important here to realize that some of the um, science denial disinformation also comes from foreign states. People don't realize that a, a lot of the propaganda about vaccines comes from Russia. Uh, Russia has a great interest in the Western vaccines failing because they've got the Sputnik V. Um, so a lot of the the, the outright lies about the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine were started by uh, Russian trolls, you know, at the behest of the Kremlin to get these lies out there, get them published in the propaganda, the English language propaganda arms, and then fed out through Fox News and other places. And it worked. Look how much of the American population has remained uh, uh, unvaccinated. The, amusing, the one amusing part here is that the, the Russians did such a good job that they also got vaccine denial in Russia. Uh, yeah. So there are people who won't take the Sputnik V now because they're afraid of all of these lies that they pushed out for foreign consumption. Per concludere, secondo te, eh, ora che il negazionismo della scienza è diventato quasi un tratto identitario di molte ideologie e addirittura di alcuni partiti politici, pensi che sia impossibile rimettere il, il genio nella lampada, come si dice, cioè eh, che cosa ci aspetta insomma nel futuro? Eh, le cose possono solamente peggiorare oppure vedi della speranza? I have to see hope. Now, maybe I'm a denier here, maybe I'm deluded, but I have to see hope, because if I thought that there was just no way on this, I, I, don't, I, I mean, what's the, the point? I, I think, look, things have been worse than they are now. Uh, there were 700 years of the Dark Ages, you know, think back to before the Enlightenment, before the Renaissance. I mean, they, Giordino Bruno was burned at the stake. I mean, yes, things have been worse than this. Um, And I think that what we need to do is realize that there are a lot more people who believe in science than don't. And one of the messages of my book is that you can have a hand in fighting science denial, even if you're not a scientist. Uh, there was a study in Nature Human Behavior in 2019, which showed that even lay people can talk to and convince science deniers to give up their um, false beliefs, and the method that they used was based on the five-step reasoning strategy that we talked about earlier. Uh, Cornelia Bache and Philip Schmid, brilliant work, absolutely brilliant, and if you don't want to read the study, there's uh, articles in Ars Technica and Scientific American about it, and it really, I, I joke with my friends that I could have read that study if my hair were on fire, because that was after I'd been to Flat Earth, and here they were vindicating the method that I had tried to use. Um, So they were showing that it had, it actually worked. So, yes, there is hope, but it will take all of us. Um, I've, I've, I've gotten out of the prediction business. I don't want to say, you know, oh, it will take a tragedy, because we've had tragedies, and it has not gotten better. Um, what was COVID but a tragedy? What was January 6th but a tragedy? I mean, it's, it's terrible. We will only solve it if everyone possible gets out there and fights it. It is 
we're in a we're in an information war, and you fight it in hand to hand, right? Talking to people. Re- again, I'm, I say war to make it sound adversarial, but when I went to the Flat Earth Convention, I had respectful conversations. Nobody was angry at me. I didn't feel unsafe. I didn't. I, I didn't. I, I only really got angry once, and I hid it. And it was because the subject moved to um, uh, uh, Sandy Hook, the, the massacre at Sandy Hook, which is another conspiracy theory that uh, the fellow believed uh, at the two-hour dinner. But you know, I, anybody can get out and do this, and um, you know, you can read about this on the internet, um, or uh, I've I've got some tips in in my book, and it's it can be uncomfortable, but you know, if you if you talk to someone face to face, it begins to erode the wall of distrust. A- any any time you talk to somebody who you disagree with, you at least get credit for being there, talking to them, not getting angry at them. Um, that's when they're going to listen to you. It may not work, but I've read a lot of anecdotal accounts of people who have used this method to talk people not only out of their denialist beliefs about climate change and about vaccines, but also white supremacy. Hmm. Um, and I mean, cults, if it can work for that, uh, it's, it's a good methodology. Uh, I didn't invent it. I found other people were using it. And it seems to work for science denial. Let me put it this way. It will work if anything can work. Hmm. And I, you know, I, if we had more people doing it, I think we'd have a better chance. Thank you very much, Lee, for this very, very interesting conversation. Thank you. I so wish I could be there in person. Uh, I remember the quotation from, uh, was it Vespucci that said, you can have the rest of the world if I can have Italy. Uh, I forget who it was that said it. I love Italy. I've been there many times. It's one of my favorite places in the world. So uh, I I wish you all uh, a terrific conference and hope to meet you someday in person. Absolutely. We'll try to bring you back the next time. Thanks again, Lee. Thank you.